This is a crash course review of digital logic. It is not a replacement for a thorough treatment, but hopefully adequate to refresh you ahead of looking at how to implement a basic RISC processor. George Boole established the rules to represent logical thought through mathematics. This was, of course, revulsive in the 1800s, but underlies the implementation of computers and digital logic in the 20th century and beyond. Boolean functions are mathematical equations that can also be represented by truth tables and can be realized in processing logic as combinational circuits. The Boolean operators are called gates when we implement circuitry. We'll focus our discussion on the three basic gates, AND, OR, NOT. These are sufficient to implement any Boolean function. The NOR and NAND gates are so-called universal gates because you can use either of them to implement the three basic gates. So if you had a bucket full of NOR gates, you could implement any Boolean function. There are numerous equivalent ways to formulate a Boolean function for a given truth table. However, we often will use one of two canonical forms to represent a given function. One of these is the sum of products, or SOP form, also known as the disjunctive normal form or the min term form. A min term is a grouping of variables that are anded together. The SOP form arranges all the min terms together as and groups and then combines them as a summation, or ORs. A Boolean function has one such canonical form subject to rearranging the order of the min terms. Later, we may see that this form results in a circuit that has exactly two levels. The first level combines every variable or its complement with every other using AND gates, and then all the outputs of the AND gates go through one big OR gate. Since every Boolean function has its canonical function form, every function can be implemented using exactly two layers of logic. To find the SOP of a Boolean function from its truth table, you look at the rows with an output of 1. If an input variable is 0, put down its negation. If an input is 1, put down the variable directly. So here x is 0, so we use the complement of x, written as x prime or x tick. y is 1, so we use y without negation. And since x is 0 here, we use z prime. So the first min term is x prime y z prime. The next row also has output 1. Here we see x is 0, and both y and z are 1, so we use x prime and y z. Combine the two min term groups with an or, written as plus. Keep going, and we end up with the five min terms connected by or gates. Hence, we have a sum of products. The other canonical form is the product of sums or POS form, also called the conjunctive normal form or the max term form. A max term is a grouping of variables that are ORed together. Let's look at the same Boolean function from before. We find the POS form pretty much the opposite of the sum of products form. Here we look at the outputs that are zeros and we invert the inputs. So the first row has an output of zero. That will be our first max term. The inputs are all zero, so we complement all three. The first term is x or y or zero. The second row is also zero. Here we see z is one, so we'll be using x or y or not z as the second max term. Last, we have this row, which has ones for x and z. So we get not x or y or not z. Note that the product of sums form has fewer terms than the sum of products form for this equation. The smaller form will also have a smaller circuit. Given a truth table, you can determine which form will be smaller to derive by counting how many zeros and ones are in the output. As I mentioned, a Boolean function is realized as a circuit with gates. A gate is made out of transistors, which are the basic building blocks of semiconductor devices. Our focus is above the semiconductor level, so we'll just stick to gates and wires without getting too far into the silicon. Here are the circuit schematic diagram representations of several logic gates, which are a useful way to visualize circuits and to think about their functionality. At the top, we have the three basic gates. Note the little circle on the knot. Sometimes a schematic diagram will just use that small circle to indicate that a signal gets inverted. Then we have the exclusive OR gate, which you may come across. And then we have the universal gates, NAND on the left and NOR on the right. Note that you can use either an AND gate or an OR gate as a building block to represent these universal gates schematically. 
Here's how you can implement the three basic gates using the NAND gate as a building block. AND is implemented by connecting the output of NAND to both inputs of another NAND. The NOT gate is realized by wiring the variable to both inputs of an AND gate. The OR gate uses the same idea as the NOT gate to start in order to negate both inputs and then combines them together with an AND. This last gate is a de demonstration of de Morgan's rule, if you remember that. We will also sometimes combine multiple input variables through gates or even produce additional outputs. So here we see two examples of three input OR and AND gates. We also have an AND gate that produces as output both AND and NAND. Now we have enough tools to draw a circuit that is equivalent to the Boolean function from earlier, X or Y not and Z. This is a direct implementation where we first invert Y to get Y not then AND that with Z, which we feed into an OR gate with X. Note again that the number of gates we need, and therefore the number of transistors, will be proportional to the number of terms in the Boolean function. Let's see how Boolean algebra helps us build a computer. We'll start by making a circuit that can do addition. First, we'll add two bits together. This function is called a half adder because it can't quite implement full addition. Here's the truth table, which has two single bit inputs, X and Y, and two single bit outputs, the sum and carry bits. The sum bit is the least significant bit you get when you add X and Y, and the carry bit is the most significant bit. 0 plus 0 results in 0, 0. 0 plus 1 is 1, and so is 1 plus 0. 1 plus 1 is 2, which is 1, 0 in binary, so the least significant bit is 0, and the most significant carry bit is 1. The sum output is equivalent to an XOR operation, since it is 0 when both inputs are the same, and 1 when they're both different. The carry output is an AND operation, because it is only 1 when both inputs are 1. So an equivalent schematic diagram representation of this truth table is given by wiring X and Y to two gates, an XOR gate to produce sum, and an AND gate to produce carry. Fully implementing addition requires us to consider the carry in bit as another input, so we need to be able to add three bits. Here is the truth table for addition of three single bit variables. Just like the half adder, when one of the inputs is one, the sum is one, and carry out is zero. When two of the inputs are one, the sum is zero, and carry out is one. Now we also have the last row, where all three inputs are one, which results in a sum of one and a carry out of one, equivalent to the binary value one one, or decimal 3. Note that this full adder actually contains two half adders within it. When we design circuits, we'll often reuse other components as building blocks to make schematics easier to understand. We will also abstract the details of those building blocks. Here we have multiple full adders labeled FA, which we connect together by wiring the carry out of each to the carry in of the next in sequence. This circuit is called a ripple carry adder, named for how the carry ripples through the circuit from one full adder to the next. This is an inefficient but simple way to implement addition in a computer. Real computers use much more efficient adders, but add, that is beyond the scope of this treatment. Another kind of useful circuit is a decoder, which takes n inputs encoded in the form of an n-bit unsigned integer and has two to the n outputs. The outputs are one hot encoded, meaning only one of the two to the n outputs is logical high, while the rest are low. The output that is high is the one that corresponds to the value of the inputs when considered as an n-bit integer. This circuit is especially useful in address decoding, where a byte address is converted into a signal to activate storage cells. This will come up later when we talk about different kinds of memory technology. A basic implementation of a decoder looks like this. Here we have a two to four decoder, which takes a two-bit integer and outputs a one from the line associated with the integer value. Here, the values are sorted in numerically descending order top to bottom. So three is at the top and zero at the bottom. If X and Y are both zeros, that is the value associated with integer zero. And if you trace the wires, you can see that the bottom AND gate receives the inverted signals of both X and Y, which will both be ones, and therefore the output of that bottom AND gate is a one. The other AND gates will all have output zero because at least one of their inputs is zero valued. A really important circuit device that you'll need to understand when we talk about processor design is the multiplexer or MUX for short. 
A mux is used to allow an output to be chosen from among multiple inputs. Here we see a picture of a 4 to 1 mux, which takes four inputs and produces one output. To select among four inputs, we need log base 2 of 4 bits. That's 2 bits which allows us to include numerically the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3 associated with each input. The two control lines, sometimes called selectors, carry this 2-bit integer that is used to select which input goes to the output. An important aspect of this circuit is that the width of the inputs does not change its basic functionality. So whether each input is 1 bit or 32 bits doesn't really matter. You still use a 2-bit selector signal to choose among the four inputs. That said, every input should be the same width and the output should also be that width. To implement a MUX with two one-bit inputs, you can generate a simplified sum of products form from the truth table of the desired output. The basic idea here is to choose I0 if S is, one, is 0 and I1 if S is 1. So take the complement of S added with I0 to pass through I0 when S is 0, take S added with I1 to pass through I1 when S is 1. The OR gates just combine the outputs to create a single bit output, which will be 1 if either of the AND gates is passing through a 1, otherwise it will be 0. Although slightly more complicated, a 4 to 1 multiplexer has a similar implementation. The structure is quite similar to a decoder in the sense that all 2 to the N possible encodings of the selector bits are used to create AND gates, while the input that gets passed through depends on which of those two to the n encodings is potentially hot. And then we collect those single outputs together in a massive OR gate, so the output is the same width as the input. Implementing wider MUXs can be done similarly, although it gets very messy. Now let's talk about sequential logic, which is needed to accommodate the ability to change values over time. A sequential circuit consists of three components, combinational logic, such as we've already discussed, a clock and a feedback signal. The feedback is needed because the circuit has to maintain its current value or state until the clock tells it to change to the next state. Let's see what this means. A clock is conceptually a square waveform with a steady period that can be used as a basis for the passing of time in digital logic. There are generally three clock sources in hardware. The first and cheapest uses the input sinusoidal power waveform coming into the machine from its external power source. This waveform, if you're plugged into the wall outlet, typically has a frequency of 50 or 60 hertz. It's not that commonly used. The second and most common is the crystal quartz oscillator, often just called oscillator. This is a crystal rock, commonly quartz, that is usually baked in an oven to achieve a thermally consistent state. When current is applied to the crystal, it vibrates or oscillates at a fixed frequency, which varies based on the physical properties of the specific crystal, but is generally stable for a given oscillator. These clocks can achieve frequencies in the megahertz range, and they are used in pretty much every computer. The third and most expensive, but most reliable, is the atomic clock, which uses the oscillations of atoms to derive a notion of time. GPS satellites derive their time from atomic clocks they carry with them as they fly around the Earth. Nowadays, there are some chip scale atomic clocks available that can give a highly precise and accurate time base for computers, but their cost is prohibitive. Regardless, we will conceptually think of the clock as a square waveform and ignore the clock source. Events are generated from the waveform based on either edge or level properties of the wave. A square waveform has two levels, low and high, associated with lower and higher voltage of the clock output. We also differentiate between two edges, the rising edge, which transitions from low to high, and the falling edge, that returns back to low from high. We can use any of these properties to identify a change in time to trigger an event, specifically to cause a circuit to update its state. Circuits that change state due to the rising or falling edge are called edge triggered, and circuits that change their state in the low or high levels are called level triggered. To maintain its state, a sequential circuit uses a feedback loop that makes one or more of its outputs come back in as an input. The basic idea is shown here where the output Q of a circuit is brought back in as its input. Note that generally we cannot connect wires directly like this diagram shows because it will cause an undefined value if both wires carry different voltage levels. We'll get back to that soon. This circuit is known as a bistable element because the output will retain its value. We call this structure a cross-coupled inverter and we'll be making heavy use of this 
as a building block for several important sequential circuits used in processor design. Our first building block is the SR latch. This circuit has two inputs, S for set and R for reset. Let's see what happens when S is 1 and R is 0. In this case, the top NOR gate will be 0 since either of its inputs is a 1. The 0 is produced as an output called Q0, which is thought of as the complement of the latch's state. The 0 also goes into the bottom NOR. Since both of its inputs are 0, its output will be 1. So the output Q of the latch is 1. We have set the latch's state to 1. Now let's see what happens when S is 0 and R is 1. Now the bottom NOR gate will be 0 since either of its input is a 1. The 0 is produced as the latch's state Q and also goes into the top NOR. Since both of its inputs are 0, its output will be 1. So the output of Q0 of the latch is also 1. We have reset the latch's state to 0. When we don't want to change the state of the latch, we can simply deassert both inputs. In this case, the input to the NOR gates depends on the current state of the latch. The Q and Q prime signals feeding back into the NOR gates will cause them to feed back into the output so that Q0 preserves the state of Q and vice versa. We can describe the behavior of the SR circuit by a characteristic table that is similar to a truth table, but it uses a function Q of t to represent the state of the circuit at some time t, and Q of t plus 1 as the next state of the circuit. So when S is 0 and R is 0, the next state, Q of t plus 1, will remain Q of t. When S is 0 and R is 1, then the next state, Q of t plus 1, will be 0, when S is 1 and R is 0, the next state is 1. Let's look at hap what happens if both S and R are 1s. We can see that both outputs will become 0. This is a problem for many reasons. But let's just look at the main issue, which is what then happens when you deinsert both lines. Assuming you can somehow make both inputs 0 at the same time, which is a design challenge in itself, because all inputs to the NOR gates are 0, the outputs both become 1s. Now the inputs to both NOR gates is 1, and so the outputs will be 0. And this instability will continue flipping the Q and Q0 outputs until some timing differences cause one output to win, but which output will win is unpredictable, so the state of the circuit is not defined. One way to avoid this problem is to clock the circuit and to ensure in your circuit design that there can't be a change for S and R to both be one simultaneously while the clock is active. This circuit, by the way, is using a level triggered mechanism to clock the circuit because it is passing a clock signal into an AND gate. So the S and R signals will only be passed into the SR circuit when the clock input is high and will not be passed in when the clock is low. The bottom figure is a block diagram representation of a clocked SR circuit. These are used to simplify circuit diagrams, which we'll see again later. It abstracts away the details of the circuitry. Note that in the block diagram, we have reversed the ordering of Q and Q0. Since we don't care about the internal details, we can draw and label the block any way we see fit. Usually, inputs will be drawn on the left, top, or bottom of blocks, and outputs on the right, but not always. So you do have to be a little careful when interpreting a block diagram. Another simpler way to fix the SR latch is to further gate the circuit inputs by the circuit outputs. This circuit uses an SR latch as the building block, but it feeds Q0 back into an AND gate on the S input, now called J, and the Q state output back into the R input, now called K. The addition of these two gates fixes the problem. Now, when J and K are both 1s, the input to S is Q0 and the input to R is Q. So if Q0 is 1, then Q will be set to 1. If Q0 is 0, and Q is 1, then Q will be reset to 0. So the next state, Q of t plus 1, will be Q0. A different, less expensive modification to the SR latch is the D latch, which passes the S input through an inverter to the R input. This means that there is really only one input and its complement. We call this input D. When D is 0, the next state, Q of t plus 1, will be 0. When D is 1, the next state will be 1. 
A typical block diagram for the D-latch is shown below. The D-latch is an important building block for registers, which are used as storage within processors. On a bit of a side note, the latches we looked at have identical circuits called flip-flops that differ only in terms of how the clock gating works. A latch is either unclocked or level triggered. A flip-flop is edge triggered. We will in fact be using D flip-flops to construct register logic. So here is a simple 4-bit register built on a D latch or flip-flop. It's fairly straightforward. The clock signal is routed to every flip-flop in parallel and each one bit input to the register is attached to one D flip-flop. The outputs of each flip-flop are arranged as the output of the register. Now we get a little more complicated. This is a basic memory structure consisting of four three bit registers or words. Each column of D flip-flops here is one register. At the bottom left, we see the clock input is being gated with a write enable signal. This will control whether or not the register file will be updated at this clock tick. If write enable is one, then the clock signal propagates to each of the four registers. If write enable is zero, the clock signal remains low for all registers and they won't change their state. The bottom of the circuit is a two to four decoder. This is used to select which of the four registers is active. That is, which registers values to read and maybe write. The word select and write enabled gated clocks are anded together and connected to the clock inputs of the registers. Only one of the registers can be enabled at a time due to the two to four decoder, and it will only be allowed to change its state if the write enable is one. The word select is also used on the right here to allow one of the registers to have its state values passed through the combining OR gates on the right side of to the output of the circuit. That is where we'll wrap it up for now. This should give you an adequate foundation to understand the basic circuit structures used in a simple RISC processor.